Welcome to Mohai, the Museum of History and Industry here on South Lake Union. I'm Enrique Cerna. In Seattle and King County, these are good economic times. The April unemployment rate was 2.8%. The U.S. Census reports that more than 1,000 people a week are coming to Seattle because of our hot job market. Seattle is the ninth fastest growing metro area in the nation, while King County is among the fastest growing counties in the country. But amid these great numbers, there are some sobering statistics when it comes to hunger. Washington State is the 23rd hungriest state in the nation. One in five kids in our state lives in a household that struggles to put food on the table. One in seven Washingtonians relies on food stamps. And one in five Washingtonians relies on their local food bank. So why amidst our prosperity is there a hunger problem here? What are the contributing factors? What are local organizations doing to not only feed the hungry, but also to provide nutritious food? And what can the public do to help fight hunger? Well, joining me now to talk about these issues and more are four people deeply involved in food security in our region. Shelly Rotondo is the CEO of Northwest Harvest, Washington's statewide hunger relief organization. Uh, Erica Diani is the nutrition education manager for Solid Ground. It's a Seattle-based nonprofit that works to end poverty and hunger. Linda Najat is the president and CEO of Food Lifeline, which delivers healthy and nutritious food to banks, shelters, to food banks, that is, shelters and meal programs across Western Washington. And Molly Hancock is vice president of programs at Fair Start, which provides adult culinary job training and education programs for the homeless and the disadvantaged. And please welcome them tonight. Thank you for being here. Well, I mentioned uh, the term food security, which, you know, until now, as I started researching the, the whole issue of hunger and how we're dealing with it, something I hadn't really heard before. But Shelley, give me a little background on that and that so, term. Food security is when people have access to adequate food and can access it in ways that are socially acceptable. And the challenge in making sure that happens now, what, what are we facing? Give me that kind of uh, overhead. You kind of talked about work. a booming economy, and uh, it's, uh, it's hard to, to um, see that booming economy and then look at the front lines of hunger, which we do. Um, despite this booming economy, we're serving record numbers. You know, when the Great Recession hit, um, we had a huge, the numbers absolutely soared. And uh, those numbers have continued to remain high, though the rate of increase is not quite as, as steep. So we're seeing people coming for, the, for help at the food banks for the first time ever. Um, we, are, we've, we used to call ourselves an emergency food system, but we don't call ourselves that anymore because people are coming to rely on the Frontline's hunger programs for their ongoing um, needs. There is no daycare bank. There is no medicine bank. There is no um, health care bank. Uh, but there is a food bank. And these are the types of trade-offs that people are making. And so they come to us for help. The people that we see, we see a lot of children. We see a lot of seniors. Over half of those we serve are seniors and children, those who are really vulnerable to a compromised diet. We see um, a lot of vets. We see um, people that are um, fleeing uh, difficult situations. We see a lot of people who come to us with health-related issues that are tied to diet. And so we make a real strong connection between the food and healthy food and uh, things like diabetes and heart disease. We see a lot of people who are working, which surprises people. We see a lot of people who are putting together two and three jobs and still not getting by. We see people who are unemployed. So, you know, we, see, we say at uh, Northwest Harvest, we run a food bank as well as distribute food statewide. And uh, in our downtown food bank, which is a pretty busy one, we say if you stand there long enough, you're going to see yourself walk through that door. So that's what we're seeing, Enrique. Yeah. Linda, um, there are so many different factors, it seems, that are playing a role in all of this. And I think we tend to forget, you know, if we're here on South Lake Union, it, things look pretty good. 
but the fact is, is if you move either north or you uh, move south, uh, things change. Give, give me some background on that. Tell me what we're seeing that's different. Yeah. You know, before the recession, we really saw hunger residing um, primarily in, um, in densely populated urban areas. And one of the things that has happened as the, uh, the cost of living has continued to increase um, is that families are moving not just to suburban areas, but are fleeing even further out into rural areas. Um, we're also seeing the size of the households that are being served by food pantries and meal programs increase really dramatically. I was speaking with a director of one of the agencies that we serve, and she shared with me that the average household size at their organization was 10. Um, and that represents multiple families living under one roof, sometimes multiple generations of one family, sometimes several families that have moved in together simply because they can't afford um, a single family living situation. Um, you know, th th the important thing I think for folks to understand is that hunger is pervasive in every neighborhood. Um, and the, the challenge of hunger is that it is an invisible problem. You can't tell if the person who is in line in front of you at the store is struggling to put food on the table. You don't know if the person who is sitting next to you on the pew at church is struggling with hunger. You don't know if your neighbor, um, who is a senior citizen, is able to put food on the table on a regular basis. Hunger exists in every nation, in every city, in every county of our state and our nation. And Erica, I know with solid ground, working really to, to deal with poverty and, and to deal with folks that are homeless and, and these types of things, I, I, I suspect that the, one of the bigger challenges is that what, whatever you're doing and trying to provide for food mm -hmm. is that providing good quality food. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I mean, that is the thing is that homelessness and poverty and food insecurity are so inextricably linked. You can't separate them. And so just thinking about how when folks are seeking food or not having access to food and when they do have an opportunity to get to a food bank or they are utilizing their food stamps at a store or the child at the um, school is getting food through the free and reduced lunch program, it's really important for that food to be just as quality and healthy as it is for any other person. It's like every single, every single person deserves to have healthy food options to put into their body, especially when they're struggling with a variety of other things going on in their home. Um, enable, to enable them to think in school and to work at their jobs and to not be struggling with a million other things going on, whether they're seeking a place to sleep for the night. Um, and so nutritious food and food that makes sense for that person or that family, um, whatever they believe, whatever they eat that is um, specific to that their specific situation, they have the right to have that particular food. Right. So, um, Molly, I know that Fair Start, and I've eaten at the restaurant, you know, numerous times, and the food is great, and I know how hard the people work there. Um, but, you know, really the focus is to give those opportunities for people that are struggling in those areas to be able to get the training so they can get out there and provide for themselves. But is this challenge, has it been growing for you for the, through the years now? So um, you put it out that we're in this era, uh, era of great prosperity here in this region and specifically in Seattle and you also point to South Lake Union. But for us, we still have waiting lists of people to come into our job training program. So uh, this year we'll serve about 450 young people ages 16 to 24 and adults who are 18 and older who are coming to us, 70% um, of whom will be literally not housed. Um, all of them who um, from time to time are struggling with hunger issues and um, who have other barriers to employment who are really just seeking to take agency and, um, and move forward with their lives. So for us, we have this wonderful kind of blend of this opportunity not only to engage people around food and culinary training and the barista training that we do with the um, individuals that we serve, 
but they're also engaged in making food for our community. So this year, our community meals, our school meals, and our, um, and our community meals teams will make a million meals this year that Whoa. will go to individuals who are in need, who are hungry. And that goes to 60 low-income daycares, and that will go to an additional 15 shelters and supported housing and respite centers. And the really amazing part about that is that our students are learning skills at the same time they're making this food. And so um, I was really struck you know, by hearing from Shelly that you, if you stand at their food bank long enough, you'll see you across the line. We've all actually had that experience and our students literally when they go to serve at the downtown emergency service center um, where we deliver meals every single day they will literally um, they may have been on the other side of the line so um, uh, you know you asked about is the need growing and it just is this amazing juxtaposition of prosperity and need in our region and you know there are some really major economic factors one of which is the cost of housing so as we work with um, individuals that get them into stable first-time employment, we keep chasing this middle wage job number. And Seattle Jobs Initiative just published new data last week that shows in Seattle to actually live in rent a one-bedroom apartment. Average rent in, in Seattle is now $1,800 a month. You need an income of $22 or more an hour. So, um, you know, as you said, um, Linda, people have to make choices about where they spend their money. And so um, we're seeing people who are out of choices. And that number is continuing to grow. So is there a, just this disconnect that we have about this and, and understanding all the other factors that are leading okay. to people being out there? I don't think hungry? we always think long term or even medium term. And I don't think we always connect the dots <laughs> because we are, and you're going to hear this over and over again, we're so these, these we're, we're so interrelated. There's so, it's housing, it's access to health care, it's employment. Um, people that come to our food banks, we, I can go up to Harborview and I can see people there getting um, emergency health care because they don't have access to health care. So we're serving the same people and we need to connect those dots. We need to work together and we need to invest and think more long term because it is going, it's costing us. It's costing us um, ethically and morally and for the individuals, and it's costing us from a financial perspective at, at, as well. So we need to look at those things. We need to feed people. People have to eat, so we need to feed people with nutritious food. You're absolutely right, we're all feeling so strongly about the nutritious food, and then we need to address those root causes of poverty um, because that is the core cause of uh, hunger. And it's complex, but we can do it, and we we need to um, we need to we need to do it. Is it, is that the connecting factor here for all of you? Poverty at Absolutely. the bottom line. Yeah. Absolutely, you bet. Hunger is a symptom. Poverty is the problem. Yeah. How many? I guess on a yearly basis. I mean, how how much food are we talking about with Northwest Harvest distributing around? Right so we'll provide two million meals a month. Um, and uh, it's millions of pounds of food. We're all, we're collectively distributing millions of pounds of food. So where we're going in our field is, uh, not only are we looking at the amount of food, the number of meals, the pounds of food, because that's important, but we're really looking at providing people with nutritious food and diverse food and culturally appropriate food because good food, uh, good nutrition equals good health, and good health equals a healthy community. And those are the kinds of dots we need to con connect and we need to um, be committed to and invest in. When you're, when you're providing more nutritious food, the pounds you distribute might go down because that's more expensive food. Um, so we, don't, um, we, we, we work hard to have ample food. Uh, but we're not just counting the pounds. We're really looking at providing the right food and addressing so many people come to us with diet-related diseases. Right. Well, let's talk about that when we're talking about the nutritious food, the, the right, and you, you also mentioned kind of the, the cultural aspect mm -hmm. as well. So talk a little bit about mm -hmm. how you try to do that. Absolutely. So a lot of the folks that we work with, so in our several nutrition education programs, are accessing food at food banks or maybe going to the grocery store and purchasing on a very limited income. 
um, or they're purchasing with food stamps, which, or they may um, think oftentimes, well, healthy food is really expensive and I can't afford that and I need to feed a family of 10, you know? And so um, something that we do at Solid Ground is we work um, in nutrition education cooking classes, interactive classes where we teach folks um, tips and tricks on how to cook really healthy meals on a really limited income or with the options that you have and making specific choices around those options and um, thinking about where you can access those foods, how you can make more out of, out of what you think might be less. And meeting folks where they're at and recognizing that not every single participant that we work with and all of them won't be able to go to you know, the store and buy everything organic and all fresh produce, but thinking about what are the choices that you can make and what can you do and, and make it a fun and, and community building kind of experience as well because that was a really important piece I think that you brought up that food isn't just something that feeds our bellies. It's also something that is really important in cultures and communities and families as an actual event, a way to bring people together. And cooking is a really important community builder. And so when folks feel like they know how to shop on a limited budget and know that they can purchase certain items and cook them and make something that they feel good about sharing with their families, and feeding themselves, then I think that goes a long way. Who do you work with to try to make sure that you can get nutritious food to be able to provide to the food banks? You know, the, the place that we turn to most of all is the agriculture sector. Hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that's really important for folks to know is that the food that we're distributing today in food banks and in meal programs is not canned goods. It's not non-perishable product. In fact, this year, 85% of the food that we distribute will be perishable or highly perishable. The top three categories of food that we'll distribute at Food Lifeline are produce, dairy, and protein. And the top three items that the clients who turn to the agencies we serve say that they need are produce, dairy, and protein. We live in an incredibly food-rich state. Agriculture is an absolutely abundant resource in Washington State. And while our organizations together may be rescuing and distributing upwards of 100 million pounds of food a year, it is a tip of the iceberg of the, the total volume of food that goes to waste in our community. Well, I'll talk about that a bit more because it seems like we waste a lot, oh. and particularly when it comes to, to produce and things. Because I, I often think that, okay, if I'm asked to um, provide food for a food bank, I tend to think of canned foods. And right. I, I don't think of the fresh foods because I'm thinking, oh, they're, they're not going to last very long. A half million pounds of food was donated by our community on the second Sunday of May through the, the National Stamp Out Hunger Food Drive. That half a million pounds of food represents less than 1% of the inventory that we'll distribute this year. It's incredibly important contributions coming from the community, and it's actually incredibly important because we don't get very much canned foods uh, that come in through the donation stream. Um, but it's really important for folks to know that that healthy food um, is incredibly available to us, 40% of the food that is produced in this country every year doesn't make it to the table. That's enough food to feed every hungry man, woman, and child two times over. Um, so we have the opportunity to rescue extraordinary amounts of food, but it's also really important to know that um, hunger that exists at the scale that it exists in our community is not a problem that we can solve through food banking. Um, we're a Band-Aid that helps to feed people who are hungry today, but food banking cannot be the solution for hunger tomorrow. Then what's the next step? What's the, what do we need to think about here? Well, we do need to feed people. Um, they can't wait to eat, so we, we absolutely have to address that. We need to address it with nutritious food and, and, and diverse and choice. Um, 
We need to go upstream. We need to look at why people are coming to food banks. Um, people don't come to food banks if everything's okay in their lives. There are a lot of people coming to food banks right now. So they are challenged by um, basic needs, housing, um, access to health care, and um, employment. As we talk tonight, there are major things happening at a federal level that are really distressing. And so one thing I would ask you all to do, and I actually have things to give to you folks if you want them, um, I would ask you all to pay attention to what's happening nationally with the nutrition programs. As important as we all think we are, and we really love our work and we really think we're important, we pale in importance when you look at the national nutrition programs like SNAP, which is the food stamp program. Um, those types of programs are at risk right now. We really need your help. Uh, we need you to be advocates. We need you to be educated and to reach out to your representatives. So we need to look at policy. We need to look at health care. I mean, these are big issues. But we need to, um, if we don't address them, we're just going to continue to try to solve this problem with a Band-Aid, and it's not working. Well, as you bring this up, just today, uh, President Trump's proposal to cut federal spending by more than $3.6 trillion over the next decade, including uh, deep reductions for programs that help the poor. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, food stamps, uh, the cuts there, almost 30 percent, family welfare, um, down 13%, cutting Medicaid, 17%. SNAP, I think, was a part of that, uh, mm -hmm. the supplemental. Uh, huge, not to say that this is actually going to pass, because who knows, they'll be fighting over it, I'm sure. But uh, that's uh, a huge impact on, on poverty programs. It's huge. And one of the things that I, I'm not sure that um, you know we've addressed yet, but thought about a little bit is, um, is having employment at a living wage and how important that is. And actually, um, interestingly, there's a really deep connection between everything you just mentioned about the federal budget and the opportunity for people to transition out of poverty via employment and, and, um, and, and middle jobs. And a big connection piece for that is SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program funding. So some of you here in Washington might know that as basic food, or you might call that food stamps. But what you also probably should know is there is an employment training component of that funding that is incredibly important to all of us who are working with people who are in poverty, who are committed to transitioning and lifting out of poverty so that they can have the self-sustaining life that they, they would like to have. And um, those SNAP ENT funds or employment and training funds go to us at Fair Start. They go to Goodwill. They go to Neighborhood House. They go to a number of community-based organizations who are really integrally involved in serving people, not only in terms of making sure that they're fed, but also that they have a pathway. So one of the things that my colleague Michael Friedman, who's here with me tonight, um, likes to say is that we all have a responsibility to feed the line, but we also have a responsibility to shorten the line. And so as part of shortening the line, those funds are critical for us, and we need to be a voice for that. Yeah. I, I want to turn to Leonard Garfield. Uh, Come up here, Leonard. Leonard is our uh, kind of historian looking back on all of these things. I mean, in many ways, we've been in these, these positions before. Okay. Well, food security is a relatively new term, as you mentioned. But food security as an issue is an enduring problem. But what I think is interesting from a policy standpoint is that in 1941, President Roosevelt said that freedom from want was a basic human right. Uh, that meant that freedom from uh, hunger, good nutrition was something that every American was entitled to. So it's been a long time that we've recognized that as a right, but an equally long time that we've tried to address that challenge in, in creative ways. And we face that pretty seriously in Seattle for well over 100 years. And some of the innovative solutions, Enrique, uh, when we decided that this was a community where nutrition was important, we created a public market that would allow the average consumer to access farmers without a middleman jacking up the price unnecessarily to get that healthy food on the table. Uh, during the Great Depression, we had incredible community-sponsored relief agencies, like the Union Gospel Mission, for example. Um, and then in our own time period, organizations like Northwest Harvest and Food Lifeline and so many others have been really in the forefront. Uh, 
Northwest Harvest celebrating 50 years this year really addressed our community during the Boeing bust when the face of hunger had changed. Uh, it was you and me and everybody else in the community and Northwest Harvest as so many other organizations today said, that is a community issue that we must all pitch in and resolve. Yeah, I remember doing stories with Ruth Velazzo then, who actually founded the organization and, and during that time uh, when, uh, you know, suddenly this whole issue of hunger really came to the forefront. I want to move over here to uh, Lamai, can you come on up here? Uh, Lamai Cox is uh, with PCC Natural Markets and she is their food bank manager. You're also doing some uh, out in the community doing things. Uh, you can relate to what's being talked about here. Yeah, absolutely, particularly on the point of uh, nutritious food. Um, so PCC has a food bank program that used to be known as Cash for the Hungry and that's been going on since 1989. And the goal behind that is to gather shopper funds. And we use 100% of those funds to purchase bulk nutritious foods for our food bank partners. Um, this comes directly from our distributor, one of our main distributors, UNFI, and it gets delivered directly to our food bank partners. And with that bulk food, we do packaging parties. So those packaging parties involve volunteers from the community. And with that, we get to package those up into family-sized portions, and then the food bank's gonna use that through the regular distribution. Um, and I'd like to note that I work with food bank partners, and they get to choose from 26 different items exactly what their community is working with. So um, they get to really decide on who they're giving to, and they know the best, so that's, that's where that nutrition food is uh, coming from, from PCC. And so when you say that they decide which communities to work with, what does that mean? I mean, are you trying to provide food also that it's culturally appropriate? Yeah, ex yes, exactly. So it's demographics. It's um, how many people they're serving in that community. They, they, we entrust our food bank partners to know their communities the best. Um, so that's one of our programs. And the other one is Grocery Rescue, which uh, Food Lifeline, definitely, and Northwest Harvest, you guys know that program very well. So we don't partner with you guys right now, but we uh, partner with our local food bank locations, 31 different organizations for Grocery Rescue. And that's food that doesn't sell during the day. It doesn't go to waste. We really want that to get onto the table, people. Thank you. Um, I think, it, actually, it was you, Linda, that mentioned to me about the farmers in this region. Yeah and uh, how important uh, agriculture on this side of the mountains, really maybe more so than the other side of the mountains, although they all play a factor in this, but in, in trying to make sure that there's some uh, nutritious food available here. You know, the, the agriculture sector has um, a, a lot of, um, of economic impact in our um, community, but has a lot to give. Um, at Food Lifeline, we've been partnering with our peer that serves Eastern Washington Second Harvest. Together, we created a program that's called Feeding Washington. Last year, Feeding Washington sourced 39 million pounds of fresh produce from only 40 farms in Washington State. That program is slated to grow to 80 million pounds um, over the course of the next 10 years, and we'll be providing Food Lifeline annually with an additional 24 million pounds of fresh produce over and above what we are distributing today. Um, we'll also be providing massive surpluses of product to other food banks around the country. And we'll be bringing in product from those areas to Washington State. The things that we grow in Washington aren't grown in California and vice versa. And as a national food bank system, we have the opportunity to share our excess produce with one another, to diversify one another's inventory, to provide greater access to healthy, nutritious foods for the clients that we serve, and to provide year-round access to healthy foods that can make a real difference in the lives of the people that we serve. I do want to mention to audience members, if you have a comment or question you'd like to ask, come on up here. I'm, uh, I got a mic. I know how to use it, so come on up, all right? <laughs> so we'd like to involve you in the conversation. Um, let's talk about uh, sort of what's happening in our, our society right now, um, and that is, uh, you know, we, I mentioned uh, with the Trump administration's uh, budget proposal that uh, has come out that would be hard-hitting on 
uh, many of the poverty programs and that. But we also have a situation now where there is an immigration crackdown happening. How are you noticing this in, in your work? Are people being, are they afraid to come and try to get food? And, and, and if so, what does that mean, I guess, long term? They are. <clears throat> and um, it's uh, disheartening for us. It's upsetting for us because people are not accessing services that they are entitled to. Um, and it has come to a point where people are not, are even afraid to come to food banks and frontline hunger programs. And so people are suffering because they're not accessing um, the services that they need. Uh, we are, uh, North Hills Harvest does a lot with advocacy. And one of the things that we are doing presently is we are setting up um, a way to respond in situations where um, ICE shows up and, and how we help our clients at the food bank. We have a, we have a network of 385 Frontlines hunger programs across the state, they're asking us for help as well. And so we are deciding how we can best negotiate this challenge, make sure people get food, make sure people feel they've got a safe space, make sure they come to us and at least get food, and helping our partner programs across the state um, address it. So yes, we are seeing it, and it concerns us um, a great deal. Let me take a question here. Can I have you move up right here? Hi. Hi. Go ahead. I'm um, Janice Tufty, and I've met a few of you before. And I have a couple questions what I hear from individuals that I know that are working and would like to access the food banks, that they don't have opportunities often, you know, on the weekends or in the evenings for food banks. And the second thing I'd like to address, and I'm not sure if any of you are involved with this, that I do know now a lot of our schools are realizing that the students aren't, don't have food on the weekends. So the yeah. schools themselves are uh, creating bags. And I don't know if any of you are involved with that to give to backpacks on Friday to children. So thank you. Those are great points. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I think that that's happening in, in a couple of different ways. I know Northwest Harvest has a really robust and, and impressive backpack program and is providing those, those schools. At Food Lifeline, we're providing school pantries. Um, for example, at Northgate Elementary, um, we're able uh, to provide free access to uh, distribution of food at least monthly to every child in the school and their family. Um, so you're absolutely right. Um, schools are, um, are a place where it is possible for us to bring our services to those um, locations and to provide greater access to foods when uh, those children and their families need that. And what about those emergency situations, I guess, on weekends and things like this? It concerns us. Uh, well, the, the, the uh, providing food for children during weekends, school holidays, and the summer, high priority for all of us. Um, one in, you know, 11% of the kids that, that get meals at, during the school year, less than 11% probably, have access to food during the summer and weekends and holidays. High priority, so we do it in a lot of different ways. I think one of the things that strikes me as I, as, as I listen to all of us, the hunger response system is probably more complex and more sophisticated than most people realize. Uh, I guess that's good and I guess that's bad. Um, when you look at produce, um, Linda mentioned, and we work this as well, we travel across the nation to bring um, out, bring three seasons of food, so you have fresh produce to hunger response agencies. Um, so it's all, you know, there's, there's so much that, that we need to address because we're dealing with so many individuals. Not having programs, not having enough programs available during, um, Front lines hunger programs during weekends and evenings, absolutely a problem. It is something we struggle with. Um, there are some programs, but they're not near enough. People who are working, which are many people that come to food banks, you know, they need to have access um, off work hours. It's a challenge for us. Here's a question here. Yes, thank you very much. I'm learning so much. Realize how little I have known about the hunger problem in our state and. Among the several questions coming to me is you've outlined that there is uh, an abundance of agriculture. There is an abundance of, of possibilities, but there is an abundance of hungry people. Where is the breakdown in matching what exists with what is needed? And yeah. part two would be, what are some remedies to yeah. overcome that breakdown? Yeah. Good point. I, I, Go ahead. I'll, I'll say there is tremendous abundance that is available. 
Um, but I, I think it's really important for us to recognize that the federal nutrition programs are the frontline support to feed hungry people. Um, you mentioned, um, Enrique, that the SNAP program um, it has been proposed for a funding reduction of up to 30%. I want to make sure that everyone in the audience understands that even if the SNAP program were to be cut by only 5%, that 5% of funding reduction would be the equivalent of all of the food distributed by every food bank in the entire country for a year. And we are talking about cutting six times that amount. There is no amount of food banking that can make up that gap. I can't, I can't agree with her more. And, and I also would say to your second question, Molly's point about work I mean, I really think if everybody had a job that wants a job, and most people do want jobs, they want to have control and dignity and, and such, um, that is a, co a core solution to the issue that we're dealing with, is employment and employment with livable wages. Yes. And, and it's complex. It's really complicated because we as a state are in nearly last place in terms of our mental health spending. We as a state have not yet figured out how to fund basic education um, for our young people. We as a state have issues around providing enough access to chemical dependency uh, support and recovery. And so, um, so those are further complicating issues that kind of go into this whole mix of poverty and barriers. And so we need to actually um, address those core underlying issues also as part of this transition. But they're all interconnected. They're I mean, all interconnected. That, that's all part of the, part of the big problem. They are. Yeah. I, I, think, I think, too, that we live in, an, in a time when facts matter. And... Um, you mean real news? I mean, I mean real news and real facts. And one of the most challenging um, aspects of the work that we do um, is to really help our community understand the face of hunger. Um, and to understand one in seven among us are hungry. One in five children. There is this perception that hungry people are all homeless people. 8% of the people that we provided food to last year were homeless. There is a perception that people who are hungry are lazy and not working. 71% of the households that we fed last year are employed. In fact, half of them are employed part-time and want to be employed full-time. There is a perception that hungry people are not educated 45% of the people who are standing in line at our food banks have a form of post-secondary education. The picture of who is hungry is an old, tired stereotype. And what we need to do as a community is to come to the conclusion that hunger is an outrage and we are allowing it to exist. And we as a community could make a different choice. So I love what you just said. Yeah, that was I love what you good. just said. And and there's another there's a, there are many pieces to that. Another one is connecting the dots between so what it looks like and what the consequences are. All of those children. So what happens to all those children that don't have adequate nutrition? They have health issues, they can't concentrate in school, they're sick in school, their performance, and that's just a vicious cycle going forward. What happens to seniors who don't have adequate nutrition? Okay. They can't live independently as long as they would otherwise. They have health issues. And so those facts, that accurate picture, those facts, and then connecting those dots. So what are the consequences of that? The, the price we pay is huge. That's right. I, I want to bring up Michael Friedman. Michael, come on up here. Uh, he's uh, with Ferris Start, and he is the director of community and school meals programs. Tell me about, you know, what you do and try to make sure with schools and kids mm -hmm. that they're getting the food and the nutritious kind of food that they need. Yeah, so the, um, the, we're doing about 2,000 um, meals a day for, for children and uh, we're doing some after school meals. You talked about uh, um, meals on weekends uh, and evenings that are being missed. Um, there's a lot of after school meals that are being missed too. I think 3% of the kids uh, who are able to get a free or reduced meal during the day, get another meal after that. In fact, a lot of them, their next meal is breakfast the next day. Um, so we're, we're working 
uh, to try to meet some of the nutritional uh, needs of the kids. You know, Erica talked about um, how um, the uh, it's not just getting food in their bellies, but nutritional uh, is, is, is nutritional. Um, uh, we have many different uh, requirements that are, are need to be met. Um, and sometimes we need to get kind of sneaky about it so that the kids will eat the food. You know, we, uh, we'll maybe um, puree butternut squash into the macaroni and cheese or cauliflower uh, to sneak it in there. Um, and we're pretty sure that many of the kids that we feed are eating better than their parents um, when they get home. And hopefully they're having some healthy uh, preferences and, and habits that, that are formed uh, when they're when they're eating the food that is made from scratch with real ingredients uh, and not processed and uh, you know there are um, changing requirements coming this fall to programs that uh, um, such as extra um, uh, whole grains and extra vegetables uh, protein as well um, so we try to stay a step up on on those requirements and make sure that all the menus that we have. Um, are uh, able to meet those needs and not just feed the kids, but um, feed them a meal that is really helping them learn um, and stay healthy. As Personally, how, do, how does this affect you as, as you're, this has got to be kind of emotional work in some respect. It's very emotional work. Uh, in addition to the school meals, we're providing meals uh, for, for shelters um, and other area uh, community centers. We're doing about 1,100 meals a day, and that's 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we haven't missed a day in almost 25 years. Um, and to see those meals go out um, and realize that in many cases, it's the only nutritious meal that they're gonna get that day, uh, it's powerful work, and we all take it very seriously. Of course, the nutritional needs for the kids are different than the meals that we're serving for adults. Um, and we make sure to, to keep that in mind. Uh, with the adults, uh, again, since in, in many cases it's the only meal that they're getting, only nutritional meal that they're getting, things like um, you know, the caloric content and also to make sure that they're um, comforting uh, food. Um, we're not just feeding um, their bodies but their souls as well. Uh, so certainly um, the menus that are formed uh, are, take that in mind. And the presentation, it's, it's a big part of it. Speaking of, let me bring uh, Danny Nadstad up here. Come on in. She is uh, she's the chef that oversees the uh, meals. So, yeah. tell me about the preparing these meals and, and making them so that, uh, as he said, it, it, uh, they, that they're, they're going to want to eat them. Yeah. So um, we work in conjunction with the students in the training program. And so the byproduct of their training is actually making these meals that go out to the community sites and. Um, we just look at what's really satisfying. We do feedback surveys to see how they're liking it. Um, it's a hand in hand, the training and um, what our patrons want and what works for them, making sure it's well-rounded. We've also started um, increasing our food recovery efforts so we can add not only um, get more on the plate for them to get you know bigger portions and filling, but maintaining. When, when you say level. increasing the food recovery, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, so food recovery is, there's excess food, like you were saying, that there's 40% uh, of the food from farms doesn't make it to the plate. So we're looking at different ways to increase our efforts to recover some of that food um, and forming relationships and working together and making it so we aren't these silos that it's just a meal program that's doing food recovery, but we're working together as a community and figuring out how we can connect and get those um, you know, that's excess food that is going to waste and putting it to use and right. back to the community. As a chef, is it kind of fun challenging in doing this? Yeah, it's kind of like chopped a lot of the time, <laughs> um, particularly with our food recovery coming in. Um, some days you get stuff like wasabi powder and pickled ginger and you're like, yeah, no one in the what shelter is going to like this. <laughs> you know, and being able to roll it into our new menus and, uh, you know, instead of going from like a two week menu cycle, maybe we're doing a month menu cycle and getting them so they don't feel like, you know, they're eating the same thing all the time, you know, the dignity of the meal. It really helps us not only increase our training opportunities, um, the students get exposed to different foods and stuff that we might not normally purchase for a community site. Um, but also it's, you know, it's fun and creative for the chefs too. And, you know, it just, uh, you know, it's this really neat trifecta. You get to put it all together and, uh, you know, 
yeah. people. Food in bellies and not in landfills. There you go. That's what it's all about. You have some creative folks here working we, for you. We do. And, <laughs> you know, it's not only only about um, nutrition. It's also about that community and the coming together. So last week we had the most fun at Fair Start, sincerely, because we got, I think, Michael, how many, 48 cases of popcorn? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Popcorn. after the U2, From the U2 concert. concert. Yeah. <laughs> really? No, go, tell me about yeah. that. Uh, well, so they, uh, the, um, the convention center, or it's the um, first and goal, there you go. It's the group that does um, meals for the football stadium and the convention center. Um, we've established a relationship with them when there's extra food after event. They give us a call, and they, after the U2 concert with the concessions, um, in addition to some really great proteins and, and other items that they donated. They gave us these individual bags of popcorn. Um, there were cheese popcorn, there was um, kettle corn, um, and so we were all eating popcorn. Every shelter uh, in the city was eating popcorn, and they were loving it. It was, you can really uh, tell the difference because the folks at the shelters, it was fun for them. You know, when their only meal is, is you know, going with a tray and getting a meal, um, you know, we all snack, right? So to, to have something that they could snack with and, and to have fun with, yeah, it was, it was, it was great to see. Yeah, we need more U2s coming to town, <laughs> right? Okay. Question here. Yeah, hi, my name's Olivia and I'm with Whole Foods Market. I do a lot of work with our community partners uh, within the state of Washington. And I found recently when speaking with them at different um, community partner panels that communication is an issue. And so I kind of have a two-pronged question. One is there seems to be a lot of concerns or lots of work that's be, being done toward a common goal and nonprofits aren't aware of each other's work. Um, obviously you guys are very aware of each other's work, but how is that being handled in different communities? Um, so we're not double working and we're all working toward the same goal. And then secondly, how, are, how is what you're doing and the, the offerings that are available communicated to the community? So whether it's other services that are doing that work, um, housing pe uh, people who are working with people fleeing domestic violence, or even when it's all these incredible school gardening programs or um, programs with the backpacks and the food, how do families find out about that? Because I've, I've worked with some gardening programs that are fantastic, and kids go home and they share the you know, butternut squash recipes and all of these things, but there are so many families in the community that really could be participating in this conversation who are unaware that their children are experiencing this K through five and now even further in schooling. So how are we communicating this? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, so something that we do uh, with our community programs is we do cooking classes with community partners specifically. So we're working with over 59 community partners in the Seattle King County and then also parts of Western Washington where we're actually reaching out to community clinics and community organizations and finding out if what, our, what we are offering and what we do with our cooking classes is something that would fit their programming. And then we connect with them and they let us know what best way we can provide that service. And so there is a big communication piece there in that we're sort of reaching out to communities and recognizing that they know what is best for them and also their locations are hubs of where other community services are already being provided. So um, that's one example. And another one, I know you asked specifically about the school programs, and I didn't mention this earlier. We do do nutrition education in schools with the, through interactive cooking and gardening programs as well. And something that we intend to do and we hope that we are doing our best at is when we are in those schools, we are seeking information from the parents and from the staff and from the community around what kind of services they actually would like as far as health and nutrition and cooking and gardening um, and how can we best support their community with the gaps that they're seeing are missing and we bring in other community partners to address those needs. And so trying not to just jump in and say, hey, we have this idea and we're gonna do this thing, we come in and say, what exactly is already here? What's really working? Who can we work with together and create a better system when it's already happening? So, you know, a great example of that is we have Farm to Table Night that we connect with PCC at a variety of schools that they donate produce to. And we connect also with the Seattle Public Utilities Program that comes in and does a composting um, 
exhibit at the same time and we're connecting with gardening programs that teach the kids how to plant seeds and so trying not to recreate the wheel over and over again. Um, but obviously there are lots of disconnects as happen within nonprofits where we're all doing more than our share of work and it's challenging to connect with other folks. I can leave it open to other people I, And I think a part, I don't know that, I think a part of it is listening as well. And that's one of the things I really love about Northwest Harvest is we listen. We have an ear to the ground and have from day one. And we listen in a lot of different ways. And when we hear, we then do things with what we hear. The ways we listen, um, we have focus groups. We go around the state, um, five different communities, and we talk to clients. We say, why do you have to go to food banks? We've done this for 10 years now, different communities. So we're getting the client's voice. We have regional meetings with Frontline's Hunger Programs. We do that all the time. We, have, um, we ask them to tell us their stories on a monthly basis. And so all of this stuff, there's many things that we do to listen. And I think that's a really important part of this. And then we take what we hear and we craft programs to respond to the need. Um, our, uh, we, we, the backpack program is a good example of that, the, the weekend backpack program. We also put together materials that we use when we go to, to policymakers. And we do this on an annual basis when we talk at a state level and at a national level. We have a lot of coalitions. Mm -hmm. All of us have a lot of coalitions. We're talking to each other um, quite a bit. So there, there are many ways to do it. I think it's important to note, however, that um, uh, there, there historically hasn't been enough cross-sector collaboration mm -hmm. in our field. And if you look at the people who are standing in line at a food bank, Many of them are the same people who are struggling with housing insecurity and who are struggling with access to affordable health care and who are struggling with access to job training and access to livable wage jobs and access to financial asset building and debt reduction. Um, so and at Food Lifeline, our next strategic plan includes opportunities to reach across those sectors and build relationships with organizations that work in those fields who are serving our shared clients and to find ways that we can bring food into their environment and put our shoulder to their wheel so that we're able to provide more for the clients who need both of our help. And I think it's a core value for all of us. Um, collaboration is a core value. Absolutely. And I would add that sustainability is, is as well. So <clears throat> unfortunately, you know, um, we're all trying to work ourselves out of a job. <laughs> and the job's getting bigger. But, um, but core to what we do is understand that there are people who are experts at food distribution mm -hmm. and experts as um, our partners at Solid Ground who provide financial empowerment training for our students who are expert and experts at food banks. We don't do those things. We partner with other organizations in the community and quite honestly are employment partners. And so I'm so grateful that PCC and Whole Foods are here tonight because not only do you support our chefs and our training, but you also hire our graduates, which is incredibly important. And, um, and actually PCC at the Columbia City Store has done this amazing thing of bringing our youth culinary students in into the store in to see the produce, in with our chef instructors and your team, and, and engaging the students in cooking in a way that is uh, so affirming for them and so exciting for them that actually uh, now you have graduates working for you, which is really amazing. Um, we have at First Start Seminole Health on site, we also have Recovery Cafe on site, we partner um, with Food Recovery, with Food Lifeline. So we. Um, so uh, these, these are really core values and important to us. And you're right, the communication needs to be greater and we need a systematic approach across our organizations. But boy, I'll tell you, I think some of us feel like we're talking all day long, um, you know, really <laughs> trying to, to get that message out and to find where the resources are. And my experience with all these partners is that they are expert at what they do and they want to have that network of support, that web of support for people so to lift out of poverty. In our sector, you see us going towards, uh, and this is national, towards a community hub type of approach mm -hmm. where we do bring together different um, facets of this complex problem. Mm -hmm. And we, we do coordinate and, and, um, and really, work at creating a healthy community 
which has so many different dimensions to it. So you do see nationally, and we're doing that in the state as well, a community hub approach. As we look at this issue, um, what do you want the public to do? Or to, yeah, I mean, we've, we've kind of laid out the, the, the challenges and the issues here now. But, but what would be that call to arms to the public in helping you out? Yeah. Educate yourself. Mm -hmm. um, inform yourself. Get engaged. And there are many ways to get engaged. And really believe that um, you personally can make a difference and that you must personally make a difference. And it can be something really small. Um, but you put, put together all those smalls and you know it's, it's impact. So um, get yourself to a point where um, you know the issue and then get engaged. Is it more than just giving money? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Come, Absolutely. Come work at the food banks. Come in, do shelter meal, be a volunteer in our shelter meal program with us. Um, come, I know Erica, you have mm -hmm. many volunteer opportunities. Yes. Get engaged because once you start seeing people as the Erica humans that they are. Erica needs volunteers, by the right? way, folks. So raise your Chefs, hand. Chefs, nutritionists, yeah. and class assistants. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really, uh, it, 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 I hope it's inspiring to hear that there was a time in our country when we had almost eradicated hunger. And that came about after a documentary was created in the late 1960s um, that went into the Deep South and Appalachia and showed that hunger in areas there was as bad as it is in many third world countries. And that sparked an outcry from Harvest the public. Shame. Um, and that outcry created a massive expansion of the federal nutrition programs. The same politicians and leaders went back for a follow-up tour in the late 1970s. And they saw that in those very communities where children had had distended bellies, just like in third world countries, um, they were now thriving because they had access to food stamps, because they had access to school meal programs, because they had access to the healthy food. We can as a society, make a choice that it's not okay for hunger to exist if we lift our voices up collectively and we tell the people who we elect that that needs to be a priority issue for them. Our budgets are a reflection of our values. And the budget that was released today says that we don't value our children and we don't value our seniors and we don't value people who have less than other people. And we as a community need to speak out now to our representatives to let them know that when they vote in October, those are not our values. And that is not what we stand for as Americans. Well, I think I'm gonna have to leave it there. <laughs> um, but I do, uh, I, I do wanna say that I, I appreciate the hard work that the four of you do, because uh, that is very, very hard work. And the same thing with, with Michael and, and your, your chef and, and Lamai and, and everybody that is involved in this effort, because I don't know about you, I've learned a lot. I think, I, uh, as someone mentioned earlier, I, I think that there's so much of this that we, we tend to overlook. Uh, and um, it's, it's been an, an educating thing for me to try to really get some understanding of uh, where we're at and uh, the challenge that we have in, in trying to deal with things uh, in the future here. Uh, and congratulations to Northwest Harvest in uh, 50 years. Thank you. And also to Shelly, who's about to retire yeah. here. So let's give her a round of applause. Thank for you. Her here. Thank you. And I want to thank you very much for being our, uh, our panel tonight, and thank you all for turning out. Thank you again to Mohai for putting on these uh, community conversations, which I think uh, are very important, particularly uh, when we're dealing with some of these really tough issues facing our community. But we all know that they're interconnected, and uh, we have much work to do. Thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate it, and good night. Thank you.